object in the sky can look like Venus. The same is true for Jupiter, for example. So I want you to try a little experiment, if you will, this winter and on into next spring. Every opportunity you have in the evening, take a look at Jupiter. How long do I want you to stare at Jupiter? If you do it for 20 seconds every night you have a chance, that'll be great. Why? Because I guarantee you that the following year, you'll be able to recognize Jupiter and recognize it any time you see it, any time it's around, for the rest of your life. Because you'll become used to what it looks like, and nothing else looks like Jupiter or looks like Venus. So again, tonight, 11, after 11 o'clock, Venus will be, I'm sorry, Jupiter will be well up in the eastern sky. You'll be able to identify it because it doesn't twinkle. If you're up in the morning before sunrise, you'll see Venus in the morning sky. Clear, beautiful, bright. You can't miss it. I could point out for you right now that up in the sky, up in this direction, out toward the south, right over here by this tree, behind this tree, Pluto is right out in that direction. Over a little bit to the left is Neptune. Neptune's right out here. And then going back over in the direction, back toward the east, that's where Uranus is. Can you see them? Yeah, no, you shouldn't see them. They're nowhere near bright enough to be seen except by telescope. Pluto you cannot see. Neptune's a real challenge because it's so small in a telescope. But Uranus is a little easier to see, and you actually can see it in a decent-sized telescope in Center City, Philadelphia. So what we have then, folks, is a path along which the planets travel across the sky from east to west. And you can always find the planets moving along that same line across the sky. When you see Jupiter rising in the evening after 11 p.m., it's on that line. Venus is on that line, but much lower down below the horizon. The sun and moon also travel on that line. And way over on the western side of the sky, just after sunset, down low and only really visible with binoculars or a telescope, even now you can see the planet Mars. It is there, but it's hard to see right now. So, in a center city environment, you can see all of these constellations. You can see Lyra, you can see Cygnus, you can see Altair. You can see the great square of Pegasus, you can see parts of Andromeda, you can see Cassiopeia right here. Over on the northern side of the sky, you can see Ursa Major, the Big Dipper, Ursa Minor, the Little Dipper. Way over on the western horizon, you can see the constellation Hercules without any trouble. As the sky continues to move on into the winter months, the one bright star you'll see also around 11 p.m., way over on the eastern horizon, that twinkles a lot, that one is a star called Capella in the constellation uh, Auriga the Charioteer. That'll be the first of the winter stars that you'll see that's really bright. So that'll show up there too. Now in addition to those planets, you can also see artificial satellites. Earlier this evening at about 6.50, I stepped outside the Franklin Institute and watched International Space Station fly over Philadelphia. Last night at the Franklin Institute program, Night Skies at the Observatory, I took a group of people out of the planetarium, out onto the street, and we all looked at International Space Station as it flew over Philadelphia last night at 8.34 in the evening. It's about as bright as the planet Venus, a little bit dimmer than Venus, but easy to recognize. No telescope, no binoculars needed. And my favorite fact about seeing satellites is this one. International Space Station flies over Philadelphia between four and seven times every day. Every day. Between four and seven times every day. As little as four, as many as seven. It's visible in the morning before sunrise, often, and in the evening after sunset. And you can see it. It's very easy to locate. If you go to a website called heavensabove.com, heavensabove.com, you'll get instructions for how to find it. Please remember when you use the URL to put a dash between heavens and above. I will not be responsible for what happens if you don't. <laughs>
But if you go to that URL, not only will you find out about International Space Station, but a host of other satellites that are visible. There are plenty of them. And then the cool thing about International Space Station, folks, is that there are between four and six people on board International Space Station at any time. Did you know that people have been flying over Philadelphia on a space station for about the last 20 years? Yes, people living in space for the last 20 years. And you can see International Space Station without any difficulty at all. So there's plenty you can see in a center city environment, even though there are plenty of bright lights. Now, it is true that the lights of any urban area make it difficult for us to see all of the wonders of the night sky that you would be able to see if the sky was a lot darker. This is something that we live with, a consequence of living in an urban area. We need light at night. Now, if you live in an outlying area, a nearby suburb, actually, you know what you can do? You can petition your regional sort of government to make the lighting in your community better. And you can do that by asking them to consider certain ways there are of using different kinds of lighting fixtures that put all the light that's needed down toward the ground rather than shooting it up into the sky. Now as it turns out, this is a really great way to save money because it takes less energy if you're putting more light down on the ground rather than light up into the sky. So for a place like Philadelphia or Chicago or New York, this is not a really great possibility of something that's going to happen because it's an enormous expense and a great amount of work and we almost need all the light we can get at night. But in outlying regions, we need to do everything we can to preserve dark skies. So the folks that are here from astronomy clubs tonight, the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society is here, the Delaware Valley Amateur Astronomers are here, the Chester County Astronomical Society is here. I hope I haven't left anybody out. Oh, also somebody is here from Willingboro, I think, as well. And these folks have star parties out at locations where the sky is dark. And I've brought a list of those, too. So if you'd like to pick up that information, I'll be happy to give you a handout that tells you how to contact these folks so you can go out to their star parties at night and see some really, really great stuff under reasonably dark skies not too far from Philly. So the closest spot I can think of is about 20 miles away, and a really sort of distant one is about 60 miles away. But as you move away, the skies get darker and you can see more. So, using the lights tonight gave us an opportunity just to see if we could make this experiment work. Could we get the lights of open air to actually point around the sky in a good enough way that would help us be able to identify particular stars in the sky. And I'd have to say, while it's great fun and very powerful to have all this microphone and the control of the lights and all that sort of stuff, I think I'll stick with a regular uh, laser pointer. <laughs> but it's been great fun anyway. So I have to extend a big thanks to the folks from Open Air, the technicians who designed the interface for me to use, the Association of uh, Public Art, and really I have to give a big shout out uh, to the artist Raphael Hemmer who really worked hard to make it possible for us to sort of play around with the lights like this tonight and create yet another aspect of the art. I mean, this is another way to think of this, folks. Okay, the lights aren't the greatest for doing this, but what it does is it does give us a, a reason to get together and appreciate the night sky in yet another way. So we can see what the sky looks like if we have a lot of lighting like this, and we can imagine what the sky would look like if we could just get over to the Pico building and hit the big switch. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. yeah. Then we could really see some stuff. <laughs> so in the meantime, let me encourage you to go outside, take a look for the planets, take a look for something like International Space Station. You know, I guarantee you folks, I guarantee you, if you sort of figure out how to see International Space Station and then invite a friend out to see it with you, it'll make you look like a genius. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I do that all the time. And it works. So try it.
But the same is true for Jupiter. Jupiter looks really great in a telescope. If you have a small telescope at home, that's the target object you want to begin with. And of course, you know, last but not least, the moon is a great target. That's always easy. And so uh, new moon first, I'm sorry, the new moon starts, I believe it's on Sunday, will be the uh, beginning of the next phase of the new moon. And you can watch it over the next uh, 28 days as it grows in its phasing. So I want to say thanks again for the, to the uh, Association for Public Art. Thanks to the open air people. I'd like to also thank my astronomy friends that brought the telescopes tonight. Please make sure you go over and take a look through the telescopes, see what's available to be seen. Stop here at the table, get a handout. And really, my thanks to you folks for coming tonight and for all your great support for the astronomy stuff I do. Thanks for coming. Good night. Have a great fall. Oh,